My name's Billy Manatix. <laughs> Look at all the miracles in this room tonight, huh? Awesome. So I want to thank the committee for asking me to come up and share my experience, strength, and hope. And um, if, you, if you see something during the weekend that you really liked, this was great. And especially if you saw some stuff that you didn't like, get on the convention committee next year. Don't talk about the problem, get to the solution. So one of my uh, sponsees texted me today and he said, carry the message, not the stone. And the reason he said that is right now I'm going through a process of passing a kidney stone. <laughs> so while I'm sharing tonight, if I happen to yell, fuck, <laughs> grab my crotch and run off the stage, you'll know what happened. I encourage you to speak amongst yourselves because I'll be back to carry the message of hope. <laughs> this too shall pass. I hope so. <laughs> if I pass the stone and smoke it, is that a relapse? I'm not sure. <laughs> So I have to set a timer because um, when I first came to Narcotics Anonymous, I didn't have any social skills. <clears throat> and now I can talk a cat off a tuna boat. So, uh, <laughs> so it happens you stick around for a while. So our message, sometimes people say, oh, he has a great message, not mine. It's ours. It's ours. And, um, and our message that an addict, and I know they put the next two words in there for me, any addict, because I look for a way out. I think, no, I'm unique, not me, that's, that's, um, that's not me. They can stop using drugs, lose the desire to use and find a new way to live. Unbelievable, what a message. And it's universal, it's for everyone. <coughs> and if you're here tonight and you're still using, you have that desire to stop using, welcome. 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 You are a member of Narcotics Anonymous. When I first came to Narcotics Anonymous, I was still using and no one told me to leave. They told me to keep coming back. So our message, no matter what language it's in, if it's sign language, an accent, and if you can't tell already, um, from Boston, uh, just outside of Boston, a city, a town called Winthrop, right across from Logan Airport. So to help you with my lingo a little bit, I cocked the car and have it, yeah. <laughs> so the moment of silence, I believe that's how I got here. You were praying for me. You were praying for me to get here. And during my recovery, as I've been clean and going through the process, that moment of silence still pertains to me at times. Because for the addict who still suffers, and just because you're clean doesn't mean you're still suffering sometimes. So it doesn't matter when it happens, but I truly, that moment of silence means a lot to me. Because we need to think about people that, you know, is struggling, including ourselves, so we can get better. So I'll share some experience, strength, and hope of my journey of where I came from, how I got here, and most importantly, how I stay here. So in the, um, in the basic text, in the second step, it talks about people tend to live a life in what they believe in. I believed I was going to use for the rest of my life. I thought the hand was dealt to me was an addict, an active addict, and I was never, ever going to stop. I truly believe that. So if I believe that, that's the way I live. So there's, uh, I'll give you a couple of days in the life of my experience. There's a lot of uh, education institutions in Massachusetts. I'm a graduate of BC. 
not Boston College, Beachmont Corner. I, I stood on this corner. I put a lot of years, I have a master's degree from that corner. I wanted to be the guy. When you needed something, you wanted something, you came to me because I could get it for you. I, was, I wanted to be the guy. You know, like, and I knew everybody's business. I knew when they got their checks and who was doing what and what. I wanted something out of it. So I wanted to be the guy. And this one particular day, a guy came down and he said, hey, Billy, take me into Boston and I'll take care of you. I don't know about you, but when someone told me I'll take care of you, you got my attention. The problem was you wasn't always telling the truth. And all of a sudden, the drugs showed up and a story came behind it. Well, I'll be right back. I'll give you something. Don't worry about it. But anyway, I said, sure, I'll take you into town. So we get into my unregistered, uninsured, illegal sticker, no front brakes car. <laughs> I probably bought that car from one of you here, I'm not sure. <laughs> so we're driving into Boston, and it starts raining out. And I'm driving down the expressway, and it's raining pretty good, and my windshield wipers don't work. I didn't turn to Joe and say, Joe, it's raining and my windshield wipers don't work. We're not using today. Because we're on a mission. We gotta go get it. I grind the window down and suck my head out the window. I gotta get there. So we're driving through one of the back streets of Boston and it was a two-way street and we used to have the trolley cars there. So some ruts in the road and the car on the other side goes through a puddle, hits me right in the face. So I just wipe off the sand, spit off the sand, and kept driving. I'm even slowed down. I'm on a mission. Ways and means to get more, I gotta get there. So now we, about two hours later, maybe three hours later, because you know how that goes. You gotta go over here, meet the guy over there. Wait a minute, he's not home, you gotta go over there, you know. That's why it cracks me up that addicts don't have patience. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Where'd you get your drugs? Are you kidding me? It wasn't like Domino's Pizza would be there within a certain amount of time, so. So we finally get the drugs and we're on the way back. Things are okay already, and I'll soon you get the drugs. I don't care if it's a hurricane, I go, things are good. <laughs> so I believe that addicts, we're the most creative people in the world. We just take our energy and put it in a negative place. We take it positive, we can do things. When it comes to getting drugs and using drugs, you know, we make paraphernalia out of anything, you know? Uh, you, give, you give us a hamster and a flashlight, we'll make a pipe out of it somehow. You know? <laughs> That's what we do. There used to be a guy, there used to be a program called MacGyver. He made shit out of everything. He was definitely an addict, there's no doubt about it. So I pull over to the store, and I go in the store and I come back out. I said, Joe, I said, look at him, I'm soaking wet. I said, it's raining even harder. I said, we gotta do something. So I go in the store, I come back out, I got two pieces of string. I tie one to one windshield wiper, one to the other. I pull it, I said, pull Joe, he had pull it. We had a little It worked. And after a while, when the string got real wet, it broke. So I says, okay, took my shoelaces out. The shoelaces are much stronger. Tied the shoelaces. When I got back home, I said, well, what am I going to do if I'm by myself? So I got a third shoelace and tied the two together in case I'm by myself. So I could use the up, I could operate the windshield wipers and drive with my knee. Because that's another talent we learned of how to drive a car with a knee. I'll take a left here, no problem. We're very talented. <laughs> Anytime I got money, I was on the hustle. I don't care how much money it was. One thought never went through my head. Jesus, maybe I should buy a windshield wiper motor with this one. <laughs> what can I get? How fast can I get it? Where can I get it? It had nothing to do with anything else of improving my life always settling for less. And I justified and rationalized why I didn't need a windshield wiper motor, because it doesn't rain that much in Boston anyways. <laughs> Crazy stuff. But that's the disease of addiction. And when they towed that car, it still had the, wind it still had the shoelaces tied to the windshield wipers, because I never, ever fixed it. Always settling for less. So, I've come to find out that, once I got clean, that the disease of addiction lies to me. And recovery tells me the truth. 
problem is sometimes the truth hurts and I don't want to believe it so I go into denial and uh, the United States Army decided it was a good idea to employ me <laughs> after they had me they realized they made a big mistake <laughs> and in my travels in the army I went to Vietnam and when I went to Vietnam, I thought everything was going to be okay because I'm getting away from those people and that neighborhood. But I didn't realize at the time that the untreated disease of addiction was getting on the plane with me. So when I went to Vietnam, I got introduced to heroin. I overdosed the very first time I tried it. When I came out of it, I wasn't upset that I almost died. I was upset that I missed the high. Who thinks like that but another, another addict? So eventually I got caught on a drug test and I was in a detox in Vietnam and the first day we're in there, nobody was thinking like, Jesus, now that I'm getting clean, I'll work on my anger issues and my spirituality. You know? <laughs> it was, the thoughts were, how the hell are we gonna get high in here? It's, it's a lockdown. They took everything from us. We were in this lockdown, barbed wire, lock gates. So one of the guys there said, hey, I heard if you take a Pall Mall cigarette and you loosen up the tobacco and you crush up some aspirins and you suck it up inside and then you take some toothpaste and you put it on the outside of the cigarette, you put it out in the sea and let it bake for a while, you can get high. <laughs> we were looking at this guy saying, this guy's nuts. And then we proceeded to get a Pall Mall cigarette, <laughs> some aspirin and some toothpaste. He mentioned something. We don't have anything. He mentioned something. So I tried it. I got a sore throat after a couple of tokes. I got dizzy. Ah, I don't know about this. This phrase I only said one time in my life and it was at that particular time. I don't want any more. You can have the rest of mine. So I told these guys, I said, you know, when I was stationed in Germany, a guy told me you can get high smoking ping pong balls. I said, I think I'm going to give it a try. I said, uh, well, uh, do what you got to do, Billy, you know, good luck with that. So I went to the rec hall and I stole a couple of ping pong balls and uh, in the middle of the night I'm sitting on the bed and I'm smoking this ping pong ball and uh, I start counting the ceiling tiles, you know, something's happening. I got high, and um, the guy come over and said, hey, I know I ragged you, called you crazy. He said, mind if I join you? I said, no. <laughs> no, sit on down, bro. <laughs> Little time went by, another guy come by, and same thing. He said, you know, I know I ragged you, called you crazy, but you mind if I join you? I said, no. So the three of us sat there, smoked a couple of ping pong balls. <laughs> The next day I went and I stole five ping pong balls. <laughs> I have company. At the end of the night, there's eight of us in a circle. We made the makeshift pipe, you know, we get creative. Now people are arguing, you bull got it, you got back in line, you took two hits and go, oh, please guys, don't blow this, we got something going here, please, <laughs> please. So the next day I went to the rec hall, I stole the whole box of ping pong balls. <laughs> way too many people now. And on the way back to the detox ward, I took two out of the box and I stashed them in the sand. <laughs> I'll share with you, but I'm, you're not getting it all. But come to the end. <laughs> so when I took the last one out of the box, I said, this is it. And three or four guys looked at me and said, you're lying, you had to stash something somewhere. <laughs> I said, no, man, that's it. So I went to the bathroom, I came back, and they flipped over the mattress, went to the little dresser thing I had there, and threatened me, and I convinced them I didn't have any more, and smoked the last two by myself. I snuck <laughs> off. And they'd look at me saying, you high? Going, no, I'm just tired. You know? <laughs> So 
the very first night when we smoked the ping pong balls, what the high was, is first I was huffing them, I was lighting the ends and huffing them, and then after that we just put them in a pipe and smoking it straight. What the high was, is I was smoking plastic. <laughs> it was shutting off the oxygen to my brain, killing brain cells, and that's what the euphoria was. And at the end of the night, I had a headache like someone drove a spike through my head. I had shortage of breath, pains in my chest, because there's consequences when we use. But you know, the next day when I got the ping pong balls, I said, I'll probably get a headache. I'll probably get pains in my chest, but I don't care. It's gonna change the way I feel. And I did it anyways. And that's the disease of addiction because plenty of times I knew there was gonna be some kind of consequence. When I stole money from the house I was living in, you know, the picture of health, me, they knew where the money was going. Who else took the money? You know, money elves broke in during the night and couldn't be my unhealthy looking addict brother, you know. Uh, so we talk about, what's your drug of choice? My drug of choice is, what's available? What do you have? I have a preference for a class of drugs. I definitely have a preference. But when that preference is not available, my choice is, what do you have? <laughs> Plenty of times I've done drugs that I didn't even like, didn't even like the high, but there was nothing else at the time. You know, I like, like, I like the basement, I like to gnaw it, you know? I don't like to be tweaking and geeking. <laughs> Everybody has preferences. And every time I did it, I went, oh my God, why did I do that? I'll never do that again. Fucking <laughs> week later, here I am, geeking again. I'll never do that again. <laughs> to all my paraphernalia away, I'm in the dumpster. What the hell did I do? <laughs> Insane. So if you take the brand of insanity or ping pong's out of that story, it's all the same. It doesn't matter what it is. A drug is a drug is a drug. At that particular time, it was a ping pong ball. It was a high. It was making, it was making me change the way I felt. I didn't want to feel the way I was feeling. So it doesn't matter what it is. You know, we put these things in, you have to have a certain drug and you didn't do this and oh, I only sniff it and all this shit. Those are just rationalization and justification of what, you, what you're doing. So I had to look at that and say, wow, you know, at the time it was happening, I didn't think much of it. So, when I came back from Vietnam, I just kept going. Just kept going and kept going because I truly believed I was this piece of garbage. You know, I was never going to get better. Now I, now I like to be in the crazy vet. Ooh, he's the crazy vet. You know, I like labels sometimes. I didn't know who the hell I was. Tell me who I am. So, after I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I've had some amazing times and I, I used for 25 years I've been clean for 25 years so it's a nice balance so it is a nice balance and I always tell people I definitely prefer the last 25 let me tell you no matter what's been going on in my last 25 years, it doesn't mean the birds are singing, the sun was shining, and there's rainbows in the sky all the time. It's, you know, life, life, life turns tough, unfair, crazy, painful, not unusual. So I prefer the last 25 years. But some things happened when I came to Narcotics Anonymous. When I first came to Narcotics Anonymous, I hated myself. I used to wake up every morning when I was using, wanting to die. My first thought of the day for years was, I wish I died in my sleep last night. This sucks. I don't want to do this today. I'm not going to use today. A few hours would go by, a few minutes would go by, and my head or my body was saying, you better put something in me. So when I came to Narcotics Anonymous, full of fear, full of fear, it crippled me. I'd be in a meeting, I had to pee so bad, but I wouldn't get up because someone's going to be looking at me. They're all going to be looking at me. I wanted that cup of coffee, but I ain't walking all the way over there and put a cup of coffee together. They're going to be watching me because I'm that important. I mean, that important. So I go to this meeting and I, I, I'd go just when it started and I'd leave as soon as it ended. 
How do you meet people if you do that? But I was horrified at meeting people and interacting, no social skills. So one day these guys surrounded me at the end of the meeting, experienced members, loving me up. Today we're going for lunch, wanna come? And I started with the Yabats. Yeah, but uh, I gotta catch the bus. That's all right, we'll give you a ride home. Yeah, but I don't have any money. It's all right, we'll buy you lunch. Yeah, I left my cigarettes home. And, oh, we got cigarettes, it's okay. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so we go out to eat, and I'm sitting in the booth. And these guys are clean for a while, so they could eat. You know, it, was, it took an hour to get through the appetizers, you know. Like, and chicken wings flying around, mozzarella sticks. I'm sitting there going, oh my God. I got a bowl of soup. I just came from a using world where, you know, like food wasn't on the, on the agenda for the day. Yeah, I think I'll shoot some dope and have a nice steak dinner later, you know, like. Maybe smoke some crack and have some meatloaf, you know, like. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching these guys go, holy shit. And this, the smell of food was actually getting me sick. You know, I haven't been around that much food in a while. I used to have pizza every couple of days, you know, it was cheap. And I figured, I guess the food groups, you get the dairy and the vegetables, the tomato and the wheat, you know, so. So I'm sitting there going, you know, I know these guys, I have to give something back. So I, so I told them, I said, you know, I'm gonna remember who's sitting here tonight. And um, when I become employable and have a job, I'm gonna remember who's here and I'm gonna take care of you guys the way you're taking care of me. Cause this is, you know, you don't even know me and this is what you're doing for me. And they said, you know, that's a nice gesture, Billy, but this is what we'd like you to do. When you get in a position that you can help somebody out, he says, do it for somebody just like you right now. Do it for another newcomer. Don't do it for us. <laughs> and he said, you know, it's not just about buying something, a meal or whatever. He says, you'll recognize a, a newcomer. You'll know it. Just go over and sit beside him. Just go over and introduce yourself. Just let him know you're there. It doesn't have to be a financial thing or buying them food or whatever. It's just nice to do, but just let them know you're there and you can support them. That's all. And then what happens is, you know, you keep doing it, we keep doing it, and that person gets better, and they start doing it, and then they do it to someone else, and it just keeps going and going and going. So I'm sitting there like a bobblehead going, oh yeah, meanwhile I'm going, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> I just came from a world where everybody takes. Nobody gives back. This never happened to me. Here, Billy, here's three bags of dope and a half ounce of coke. And when you get the money or the drugs, give it to somebody else. <laughs> Didn't get that. But I stayed around long enough that I understood it. And I understand it today that we, we help each other. These people are not products anonymous. I've seen it and I practice it myself that you don't even like someone, but you help them when they're in trouble. It's, it, it, this is our life. This is a lifesaver. This is, this is life or death. This is not like a bowling league. You know, this is, uh, you know, in fact, Johnny used to cheat. I'm glad he's gone. You know, it's not that. It's a life and death matter. So people help each other in here that don't even like each other. In the spirit of recovery. You know? So now I have eight days clean and I'm still living with my sister and because she asked me to leave and I went and got clean and I, I'm calling halfway houses and, and shelters and stuff and so I'm sitting at the kitchen table with her and she gets up to go to the bathroom and she takes her pocketbook. Now this is a woman that I stole from as much as I could. She used to manage a bar and I'd be crawling around at night looking for the money bag and take money out of it. You know, and she knew. And that's why she said, you can't live here. She goes, especially, she goes, you're gonna die in that room and I just can't handle that. So anyway, I'm sitting at the table, she goes to the bathroom, she comes back after she took her pocketbook and I said, sis, what are you doing? What do you mean? She goes, the bathroom, you take your pocketbook? I get eight days clean. <laughs> are you kidding me? So she said, you know, in eight days, I noticed a difference in you already. You keep doing what you're doing. I was doing two, three meetings a day. I wasn't working. I was taking the bus to meetings. Sometimes people would pick me up. And I was doing like 14, 17 meetings a week. And um, 
She says, you keep doing what you're doing. But as far as trust, I'll let you know when I can trust you. Oh. So I, I realized at that time that trust isn't something I can tell you about. It's something I need to earn from people. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer with some people. And I don't need to allow people to go on, you know, when they trust me, or, or their healing process. It's all different. I wanted people to forgive me and everything's wonderful now. I want to parade down Broadway if I'm clean. So it was, it was a learning adventure because, you know, the word trust in the street was no meaning. This is good, right? Oh, trust me, it's real good. <laughs> be back in a half hour, right? Oh, trust me, of course I'll be back in a half hour. <laughs> now, this check's good, man. I'll screw me now. Of course that check. Trust me, that check's good. No, no meaning at all. So I, I love our literature. And one of the reasons I love our literature is written by addicts for addicts. I just love that. So one of my favorite readings is, and it works on why, page 112, which is the end of the 11th step, and it says, we see that regardless of the presence or absence of material success in our lives, we can be content. We can be happy and fulfilled with or without money, with or without a partner, with or without the approval of others. We begin to see that God's will for us is the ability to live with dignity, to love ourselves and others, to laugh and to find great joy and beauty in our surroundings. Our most heartfelt longings and dreams for our lives are coming true. These priceless gifts are no longer beyond our reach. They are, in fact, the very essence of God's will for us. And that's my goal. That's what I want to be okay with, you know, regardless of the, uh, the presence of absolute material success, because when I first got clean, I love stuff. I love shopping. I was out of my mind. Even today, I go in a store, I see the clearance sign. I got to look. I got to look. I, I buy shit that doesn't even fit me because it's a deal. <laughs> but it's on clearance. But it's too big for you, Bill. That's why I'll probably get fat. I'll fit into it. But it's too small for you. Oh, I'm going to lose weight anyway. So I, I start buying shit for other people. No, oh, they'll like this. It's, hey, they want 100 bucks. It's $20. I got to get it. So I can get addicted to that. I can get crazy with that stuff. Stuff. Got to have stuff. And then to enjoy our surroundings and the beauty of it. Like today, I took a walk down to where they had the uh, Tulip Festival. I mean... Enjoying looking at tulips. I never, I never said, hey, Flacco, yeah, I, I want uh, four bags today. I, geez, could you hurry up? Because I'm going to go look at the tulips in a while. Because I can't wait to see that fiery reds in them, you know, the vibrant orange and them lemon yellows of those beautiful tulips. So could you hurry up? <laughs> never enjoyed life. And today I'm just looking at it. I said, wow, this is awesome. Then I'm walking back and it starts pouring out. People are running under the trees. I went under the tree for a little bit. I go, and it's only water. I just started walking in the rain. I never enjoyed any of that before. It was nice. I got soaking wet. I came back. I got to the, the hotel room. So I had a very interesting day because I'm passing that kidney stone and I guess it's messing with my body. So I'm grateful for this. I made it back to my room. I thought I was going to fart and I shit my pants. <laughs> Grateful I had other clothes to change into, right? I find humor in it, though that was interesting. <laughs> Tulip soaking wet, now I shit my pants. This is quite the day. Seeking the approval of others. I was on a mission to make everyone like me. And one of the definitions of humility is do something nice for somebody and don't tell anyone. When you're seeking the approval of others, that's very difficult to do. Because I want, I want to tell you what I've done for someone so you can tell me about how good I am. What a nice guy I am. I had four or five years clean and I find a wallet. I go out for, I go out for lunch, I'm working in this uh, office, and I go out, and I see this wallet on the ground. Pick up the wallet, open it up, 
looking for the guy's information, because I'm going to return it. I did count all the money and look at the credit cards. I didn't take anything, but right? you know, still, still getting better, you know. So I call the guy, and the guy comes down, and he's all excited. Oh, my God, thank you so much. It was right around Christmas time, and oh, thank you. Here, let me give you something for it. You know, I appreciate it. He's trying to give me money. I'm going, no, to give it back to you is a reward in itself. <laughs> Complete lie. <laughs> Absolute lie. I went back to work. The first person I saw was the receptionist. I said, how you doing, Emily? I, uh, yeah, I found the wallet when I went out to lunch. And <laughs> gave it back to the guy. I didn't take a reward. You know, I just wanted to be honest. That's so nice, Billy. Oh, you're such a nice guy. So you're honest. That's wonderful. I told everybody in the office. <laughs> yeah, I just went out for lunch. So I didn't get lunch because you know, I got to get back to the office and tell everyone how wonderful I was. I had them tell me how wonderful I was. So I go back out to get my lunch. I started telling people I didn't even know. <laughs> you know, I have a ham and cheese sub. And yeah, by the way, I uh, found the wallet today. <laughs> Turned it and take a reward. Oh, you're a nice guy. Thank you. <laughs> Unbelievable. And one of the reasons I had no idea who I was, because I didn't want to do any step work. So for the longest time, with all the stuff I had, because I had a great, it was 1990, I'm making 50, 50 to 70 thousand dollars a year. That's nice money now, never mind back in 1990. I hit the lottery for 302 thousand dollars. I'm living on this apartment overlooking the, overlooking the ocean, beautiful. I'm in this relationship, I had no business being in that relationship. I had a nice car, but I wasn't happy. And I'm saying, what's happening here? So what it was, I look at it like, you know, you go buy a brand new garbage can, nice, shiny, beautiful. So on the outside, it's nice and beautiful and shiny, but you open up that garbage can and it stinks because there's garbage in there. And that's what I was. I was a dressed up garbage can. I had all this stuff inside, didn't know who I was. Didn't, I was scared to find out who I was. And here I belonged to a 12-step program. He like stepping it up, I love stepping it up. If you don't step it up, you'll be using it up. So, to me it's like, here I am, belong to a 12-step fellowship, and I don't want to have nothing to do with the steps. I don't like to read, I have ADD, all the excuses come up, you know? Oh, I got this, I got that, I got this. When I was using, I paid attention when you showed me how to put something together. <laughs> so it hit me one day, you know, the readings, I'm listening, listening, all of a sudden, if you want what we have to offer, and you're willing to make the effort to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. These are the principles that made our recovery possible. I'm like, wow, that's it. Because I used to say, well, I, I go to meetings. I, you know, I, I like the dances, I, I like the campouts, I like the conventions. I like the fellowship. I didn't want to get with the program. But I went to all those camp outs and this and that. I was hoping I'd get lucky, get a little something, something, you know, like, ooh, that'll fix me. So I looked at it like me just going to meetings and not doing the work. It's like joining a gym and going like five, six times a week. And I go in the gym and I just watch people work out. <laughs> I go five, six times a week. I don't feel anything. I got a personal trainer. I wave to him once in a while. I don't get it. So, another time that it really hit me, one thing, more than anything else, they'll defeat us in our recovery and indifference or intolerance towards spiritual principles. Three of these that are indispensable. Honesty, open mindedness So the how of the program. The how of the program. One thing more than anything else got my attention. So I had a guy come up to me and says, Billy, I know you're struggling with the steps. There's only one step. I go, here's the guy, the shortcut guy, all right. <laughs> There's only one step, he said. He said, you need to go from self-centered to God-centered. 
I said, well, how do I do that? He says, do the steps of Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> And then I had someone else come up to me and goes, listen, it's the how of the program. The spiritual principle that's attached to every, every step, but it repeats itself. The how of the program constantly repeats itself. H-O-W, H-O-W, H-O-W. First step, you need to be honest of who you are and that your life's unmanageable. Be honest about that. Be open-minded. There's a power greater than yourself that can restore you to sanity. And once you have that, you'll be willing enough to turn your will and your life over. And once I got the first three steps, and I realized the manager was me, that I had to fire the manager, well, I, a manager, I went up to a mirror and said, you're fired. And I got a label maker and I put, under new management. So every time I looked in the mirror above my head, it said, under new management. <laughs> and then the how it repeats itself. I needed to be honest to take that fearless inventory. And it's not all about the bad stuff, it's the good stuff too. Just to find out who I am. And then be open-minded enough to share with myself, God, and another person. And then be willing enough to look at my character defects and be ready to give them up and say, I don't want these anymore. These are not survival tools anymore. I don't want this anymore. It's too painful. And to be honest enough to say, it's not me getting rid of them. It's God. It's not me. It's God doing this. And then be open-minded enough to make that list. Not take school. Be open-minded. Write it down. Be willing enough to make those amends. I had years and years clean and went and made those amends. And some of my family members going, no, 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 that's okay, you're, you're doing good. I said, no, I need to do this. And then be honest enough to take that inventory and look at what the day was. Sometimes the day's good, I, don't, I didn't do anything off. I, I did things great, it was a great day. And then be open-minded enough to improve my conscious contact with the God of my understanding. And I got into meditation and prayer. And when I started meditating on a regular basis through Narcotics Anonymous, I became like, an, like a magician or an illusion, illusionist. Because what happened, when I started meditating and praying more, assholes were disappearing. <laughs> it was amazing. There wasn't that many on the road anymore, in the store. And then be willing enough to practice those principles in all my affairs and carry the message to the addict that still suffers. Amazing process. It was only because of the experience that I heard in Narcotics Anonymous and the pain that brought me there. His relationships that mean a lot to me. My sponsor guides me through the steps, which allows me to get closer to God with a better relationship with God. And when I have a better relationship with my sponsor, with God and the steps, I have a better relationship with me. And then I can have a relationship with somebody else. Because I've been in so many relationships that were over, I was still in them. <laughs> and today I have a relationship, it's the healthiest, most loving relationship I've ever had in my life. I'll be 65 in a, next week. This relationship was worth waiting for. Because I've been open-minded to it. And it kind of feels like, this relationship kind of feels like, you know, you go out in the storm and you're soaking wet and you're cold and you're freezing. And then you come home and you, you know, take a hot shower, you get some hot beverage and you're sitting there and you're feeling good. That's what this relationship feels like. Been a long time waiting for that. Only because I was open-minded. Only because of that. And being 65, I enjoy life. I love life. I do stuff that's incredible. I can run with the big dogs. For most of the day, not all of the day. <laughs> you know those energy drinks? You have to have the energy drinks? I don't need any energy drinks. Energy drinks. I need a can of slow the fuck down. <laughs> I might call it Green Turtle instead of Red Bull. I'm not sure. So I know I have to wrap it up and um, in, I was 15 years clean. I wasn't connected to NA. I was a thief. I wasn't giving back. I was, I was doing life and enjoying life and starting to get miserable again and I wasn't connected and I was meditating one day and I got a thought from God that said, why don't you do 90 and 90? My ego said, I have 15 years clean. That's the ego, that's the disease working. Two and a half months after I'm into that 90 and 90, I, I'm at a job that I, I was working at for a month in my town and they said, well, we love you, we're gonna keep you. And then I, next day I go in, they said, the guy got a lawyer, he's coming back. I gotta let you go today. 
I go back to tell my wife, and she says, I'm sorry to hear that, but I, I want a divorce. And it wasn't like a shocker, you know, it wasn't like, there was trouble in paradise, you know. We hadn't had sex since the Flintstones were on TV. So, <laughs> so but the thing is, is, I didn't want to use over it. Five months later, my mom died. And I knew God was preparing me for the storm that was coming. If I hadn't been, you know, hooked up again, I don't know what would have happened. You know, and, and they, I heard a saying one time says, don't tell God how big the storm is. Tell the storm how big your God is. So I was ready. So I was ready for it, you know. And I heard another phrase that, because, you know, like, if I used, you know, my employer weren't saying, like, hey, I heard you really got a crazy heroin habit. We'd love to have you back as an employee. <laughs> My wife's, you know, like, hey, I heard you're really out there, you know, using crazy, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I'm really attracted to you now, now that you're strung out like Pinocchio, you know. <laughs> and most of all, if I use it, my mom wasn't coming back, you know. Instead, I could be there for my sisters and really feel the feelings of my mom, you know, passing. You know, it was a spiritual uh, experience sitting in the hospital where for nine days as she passed, you know. So it was, it was all a, an experience that only because of what I was doing, you know, only because of that. And I heard that death ends a life, not a relationship. So I still talk to my mom, even coming here and going, hey, mom, I'm going on, mom, look at this, look where I'm at. I still talk to my mom. I still talk to addicts that have passed. I still feel their presence sometimes. I want to keep their spirit alive. So I know I went over a few minutes, and um, I want to thank the committee once again to you know, asking me for coming up all the way from old Massachusetts, and I, and I love the journey here. I love the people I met. If you're struggling, let someone know. My niece sent me a card one time, and it said, may peace with the past and faith in the future gently guide you through today. And I think as addicts, we really need to hold on to that. We need peace with the past. We need to have some faith in the future and be gently guided through each day. Peace, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.